gets you a bank that is interested in partnering with you and helping grow your business. Those of you who have been joining the webinar series from the very first day would know that this has basically been my my salmon, you know, from the first day. It's important that when you're going to partner with the bank, you choose a bank that is genuinely interested in seeing your grow, seeing your scale as a business. MSME scalability is what we're about as far as our MSME proposition at Keystone Bank is concerned. My name is Clement Azuli. I haven't gone for a name change and I'm still your host. I'm excited to bring to you the grand finale of our three-day webinar series on taking your SME business across borders. Now, here's a quick recap. Day one, we looked at AFTER and the opportunities it presents. AFTER, by the way, is an app acronym for the African Continental Free Trade Area, and then the opportunities it presents. And then we thought about the fact that for you to leverage the opportunities within AFTA, then you must also know the options that you have as far as the SME Forex window is concerned. So we brought in another subject matter expert to talk to us yesterday about the SME Forex window. And then today, we're going to be talking about um, positioning as far as branding is concerned. So we're going to be, we're going to, we have a subject matter expert in our midst as well. Her name is Gloria Enyinaya, and she's going to be telling us about how to build an international SME brand. You'd agree that if we have imbibed the skills that we need to compete in the global market, then we have all it takes to, to scale as a business. And then imbibing the skills also involves making sure that you have an internationally sellable brand. It's extremely important that you have an internationally sellable brand. Um, Keystone Bank has been on about bridging this knowledge gap that we believe can serve as a constraint to leveraging the opportunities that exist in international trade. Again, this is another opportunity to bridge that gap and then here is going to be um, a, a session of a lot of knowledge sharing. We're going to be teaching you basically how to build your SME brand um, internationally, so to speak. So I'm going to be reading out the profile of the speaker, and then without further ado, we'll get to the business of, of the day, and then you can learn all you need to learn about um, position as an, positioning as an internationally sellable brand, so to speak. So Gloria Enyinayan is an international business consultant who works with organizations around the world to ensure full adoption of trans transformation initiatives and improve their performances. A Prosky certified change manager, Glory has managed change on several projects in the public sector and private sector, including Accenture and other blue chip companies. Glory created Clears Africa, Africa's first consulting platform, which has advised over 250 entrepreneurs. As an advisor, to the Center for Global Enterprise and Grow Movement. She has advised over 200 women entrepreneurs. She's a globally certified management consultant and a fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants of Nigeria. She has written for leading publishers like Wiley and Rutledge and speaks at conferences in the Middle East and North America. She facilitates sessions on strategy and entrepreneurship at the Lagos Business School and with Genesis Business School. She blogs about business at www www.gloryayinaya.com so you might want to check that out after this session. Glory holds a BSc in accounting not just a BSc, not your regular BSc, she's a first class honors all right and then she's and that's from the University of Nigeria on Soka. She, she has she holds an MBA with distinction point, point of note from Lagos Business School and is currently studying for a PhD in strategic management and entrepreneurship. Glory is definitely a bookworm. She sits on the governing board of Beta Gamma Sigma, a global business honors society, the Association of Chain Management Practitioners, ACMP for short, Nigeria, and Dominican College. Without further ado, I'd like us to welcome to this session our very own Gloria Eginaya. But before she speaks, I'd like to, I'd like to ask, um, I'm aware that I stumbled on a quote recently by Walter Londa, and then he was saying that products are made in factory and brands are created in the mind. So that tells me that you know, the game of branding is a mental game, so to speak. So I'd like to know how, I mean, how can, how is it even possible that the brand I create becomes something that is sellable in the global market? How does that happen? Do you want to tell us about it? Okay, thank you very much, Clement. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to, to address the first question about uh, a brand being 
a mental a mental construct. I completely agree. So uh, someone says your reputation is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And in the same way, your brand is what your customers, your stakeholders, even your competitors say about you, you know, when you're not there. So it's very important that you create the right image in the minds of, of, of people. And uh, this in this webinar, we're taking it up a notch. So we're not just talking about branding, we're talking about international branding, meaning making sure your global your, your business is, is one that has a footprint in more than one country. For the purposes of uh, this series, we're focusing on Africa. But you know, this is even I mean, the globalization has made it possible for small and medium enterprises like you, like yours, to become what we call micro multinationals. So you're small, but you have presence all over the world. And it's possible. It does sound like a great dream, but I am proof. I, I believe, you know, I I am, I am also proof that that kind of uh, aspiration is actually a reality. I uh, started my uh, consulting platform, Clears Africa, uh, in 2017, and as of today, I have uh, consultants in the U.S., in Mexico, in Canada. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be speaking uh, to an audience in Germany. I'm I'm just a regular SME, you know. Uh, I'm not I've even up to five years in the market, but I've been able to use a couple of strategies to make sure that my, my business is known, not just in Nigeria, but in other parts of the world. And I'm very happy to share some of my tips, strategies, and secrets with you so that you can do the same. Okay, so uh, now if we can just uh, jump right into it. Sorry, okay. Just a minute now. Okay, <laughs> all right. So today we're going to run through um, general introductions. Then we'll discuss how you can define yourself, your products and your customers, review your website. Your website is, is the face of your business that everybody around the whole world is going to see. So how are you going to make that website not just acceptable in Nigeria, but globally competitive? Social media, of course, that's your mouthpiece to the world. That also has to be designed with your global lens, your legal review, accounting review, process review, and next steps. So one of, what some of you may be saying, uh, we signed up, we thought this was a branding uh, webinar. Why are we talking about legal accounting and process? But one thing you have to bear in mind as a business owner is that uh, by branding, you're creating a promise, an impression in the minds of your customers. And the worst thing you can do is to not have the infrastructure in place to uh, make that uh, to deliver on that brand promise. So while you're thinking, so don't just think about the packaging, you know, the style, the razzmatazz, you know, uh, coming across as globally competitive, but also ask yourself, when you made that sale, when you've established that presence, when you have that brand, what do you need to do to make sure that you can actually deliver on your promises? Because as we know, a business that doesn't deliver on its promises is actually a fraud. It's not a business. So that's why we're looking at legal accounting and also process. Uh, and if you want to go a bit deeper, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll give you a few tips uh, at the end of the webinar. So it promises to be an exciting session, and I, I'm, I hope you're looking forward to it as much as I am. So congratulations, you're here in this webinar. That means that demonstrates your commitment. So you're not just talking about wanting to grow your business, but you're actually willing to invest the one hour or one and a half hours required for you to grow your business. So that is actually, it's very commendable. Many people say they want to uh, improve, but they're not willing. To. So I hope you, you, you stay here and you know, get all the information that I'm here to give. So exporting is complex, but it's not complicated. Meaning it's complex because um, it's like playing chess in 3D. So you know when you're playing regular chess, uh, it's just you and the, and the opponent, and you just have to focus on matching and uh, surpassing the opponent's moves. When you play it in 3D, it's like, you're seeing it from different perspectives. So it's not just a regular game, but you also have to think about other implications. In this, uh, in this case, uh, in your own culture, in here in Nigeria, at least you understand to an extent the business culture, you understand the rules of doing business in Nigeria, but the target market that you want to go to, whether it's Ghana, Namibia, South Africa, has a different business culture and different rules. And you need to be able to know the moves, to make the moves to win. Now it sounds like a lot of work, but it's worth it because, of course, the payoff is greater. Why stay local when you can conquer the world? Okay, 
So the first thing you have to do is define yourself as a global company. So it starts in the mind. Um, don't think there are two. There are two ways you can approach this. You can you can approach this uh, by saying, uh, "Well, I'm a Nigerian company that just happens to export to Ghana." No, that's not the mindset. You have better chances of success if you say, "I'm a global company that just happens to be headquartered in Nigeria in Lagos." Right. So the world is actually a market. Nigeria just happens to be your head office. You're not a Nigerian company that is trying to export. You're a global company as president that has its headquarters in Nigeria. Then another way is to view global markets as an add-on. So you say, okay, my primary market is Nigeria, but we have a subsidiary in Ghana. No, you, the entire world is your market, right? You're, you're a global citizen. And so, you know, the world is your oyster. Then another uh, not, not so successful approach is to say, okay, this is the way we sell. This is the way we market. This is the way we process in Nigeria. How can we adapt it? to meet the requirements of maybe Ghana, uh, South Africa, or wherever else we want to go, you have better chances of success if from the beginning you design your sales, your marketing, and your processes, bearing in mind that these processes need to be flexible so that you can succeed in multiple markets. Now, how do you define your products? You know, you need to be able to ask, answer a few questions. I mean, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm this is uh, this, uh, I'm not, I, I would like this top, this uh, webinar to, um, if possible, if, to, uh, to result in a roadmap of sorts. So I would encourage you to take notes of the questions I'm going to ask. Obviously, you know, there, there are 64 of us on the call. Everybody's going to have a different answer. But if you just take notes of the highlight and then take it back and reflect on it, you know, so that you can start coming up with the initial ideas to guide your global expansion plan. So first of all, what's your product or service? What problem or pain does your product or service serve? Um, what sets it apart from competitors in Nigeria and in other countries and markets? If, for example, you sell, you, you, put, you manufacture biscuits, I mean, that may, it may be great that you have um, a market in Lagos, but for you to be able to sell, uh, export those biscuits outside Nigeria, you have to ask yourself, what is so unique about your biscuits that they won't just be acceptable in Nigeria, but also in other countries and markets, they're going to be acceptable. So as you can imagine, that that is that really does take a lot of work. Um, but it's not impossible. I mean, we have brands like Mercedes and, and so many other brands that have managed to be globally competitive. So yours shouldn't be uh, different. Then you also need to, in addition to defining your um, product or service, you need to define your customers globally. So why would someone want to buy my product or service, as opposed to other options. Where would they live? What motivates them? So if you already start thinking about the, getting, trying to get into the head headspace of your potential global customers, then you know that gives you the ammunition you need to, pen, to penetrate. And there's a tool for doing this. It's called the customer persona. Um, to help you understand your customers, one helpful technique is to develop personas. I've put in some links here. Um, I'll just read them out quickly. They're easily accessible on Google. So if you just type in inc.com, um, six golden rules for creating marketing personas in the new digital world. The article is great. Also, if you go to buffer.com and search for marketing personas beginner's guide, that would also be good. And then blog.alexa.com, 10 buyer persona examples. And then uh, uh, you, can, you can use the help to create the the uh, the personas. So what you need to do is develop two to three personas of customers that you currently have, people you serve now in Nigeria, and then develop one to two personas of customers that you're going to meet in your target international market. By now, I'm sure, I hope you've already started identifying some of the potential uh, markets you want to ex export to, whether it's Senegal, whether it's Kenya. So as much as possible, if it's Ghana, you know, you, you can, you can title the, you can call the um, persona Kofi to give him more of that indigenous feel. And then ask, okay, so Kofi is your, is your target customer in, in Ghana. Where does he live? Okay, he lives in Accra. Where does he work? Works in, 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 a, in a gold, <laughs> gold manufacturing, a gold mining uh, company since, you know, that could be one of the industries in Ghana. Uh, what team does he support? What does he like to eat? What does, so... Um, all these all these details are helpful for you to be able to construct an idea of of uh, who your target customer is going to be in in the market. It will be disastrous if you 
if you uh, feel you're going to use the same mindset that you approach your Nigerian customers to approach your international customers, it's like putting old wine into new wine skin. And you know, that's, that, there's no way that's going to work. So you need to start doing the research. Uh, for example, what are the personality traits of people in this country? So for example, um, in Kenya, you know, they're very athletic. So um, if you, if you uh, sell, if you produce biscuits, can you think of a low calorie version? Because, you know, if they're going to be athletic, it means they're conscious of their health. So the sugar filled biscuits you sell in Nigeria may not have such a good uh, reception in Kenya, simply because if you're there, they're more, they're more active, they're more health conscious. So that already starts giving you ideas of how to adapt your product. Or um, uh, for example, in South Africa, uh, the, okay, we're going to see examples of branding in South Africa versus Nigeria, so so I won't I won't spill the beans yet. But the takeaway from that side is that you need to be able to develop the customer persona for at least one or two personas for every market that you want to expand to. Then your personas will be different in different cultures, and you may be saying, "How do I understand other cultures when I haven't lived there and I haven't visited there?" Well, I would like to recommend this book by. Terry Morrison, it's called Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. And uh, it talks about how to, uh, the best-selling guide to doing business in more than 60 countries. So definitely, if you get it, you have a sense of, okay, what are the cultural do's and don'ts? What are the traits of people in more than 60 countries? So you can, you, I recommend, I highly recommend that you, you get that book. Okay, now we're going to look at your website. By now, I, I hope everyone here has a functional website. Uh, and uh, so assuming you do have, if you don't have one, please start investing in getting one. Uh, if you can't rely on your shop or your office in Nigeria, obviously nobody's going to take a, 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 take a flight from Ghana to Nigeria to come and patronize you. So you absolutely need to make sure there's an, you're accessible online. There's an online sales channel that you can use to reach your customers. So when you have that website, you start looking at, start by looking at architecture. Can your website handle extra traffic? If you just built your website based on WordPress, you know, a simple WordPress um, site, then it may not be able to handle it, you know. So you may need to uh, speak to a web designer to make it uh, more, to add in some extra uh, security uh, features, make it maybe e-cart or um, shopping cart functionality. Just a simple regular website won't do if you want to scale across, across borders. Then if you're selling online, do you have a shopping cart? What credit cards can you accept? Um, now with the acquisition of some fintech companies by companies like Stripe, we have a wider range. So um, you, you, you should start looking at making your website PayPal enabled. Can you, can you uh, uh, accept credit cards? You know, the usual suspects, uh, MasterCard, Visa, Think through what websites, what um, uh, currencies can you accept? Like I said, now the fintech space in Nigeria is very active. So you're not just restricted to the cards that we have in the Nigeria. You can actually get on Stripe and PayPal. So I, I recommend you look into that. Then user experience, is your website up to date? I cringe, you know, sometimes when I go to websites and you see uh, maybe the dates on the website is still 2007 and this is 2021. It makes you look as if, you know, People, nobody visits the, the site is dormant. And that's not the impression you want to create. So check, is all the information accurate? Is it up to date? The picture of you that's on it, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it has it been updated? Your team, has it been updated? Is it accurate? You know, it should reflect reality as much as possible. Is the presentation appropriate to the audience? This again, at this point, you need to reflect to your personas. So for example, if your present, if your um, persona is of a 60 year old man, then the website uh, has to have a certain look and feel, you know, to appeal to that kind of person, as opposed to something that's targeted at millennials or, you know, younger people. So the web, the look and feel of your website should be appropriate to your personas. Next, is it easy to find what you want on those sites? You should look at the navigation, navigation bars, is there a bar at the top that very clearly spells out exactly what uh, your site offers? You know, you, you, as long as it's tastefully done, you can even have a button that says, uh, click shop now, or, you know, click here, or, you know, call out, call out, call out uh, buttons that draw attention so that as soon as people get on your site, people have very short uh, consideration spans or rather our attention spans. So you really can't afford to waste too much time. They don't need to start digging everywhere in your website before they 
get to where they can transact with to look at that, make sure the user experience is, is on point. Can you get to the key sites in one or two clicks? Um, as you know, if, if, um, if someone wants to make a purchase, you don't need to send them, make them through, go through five, five, five hoops. So go to this page, click on this page, click on that page. You know, they could just easily lose interest on the third click and then go somewhere else. So you need to quickly engage them and you know, get get their attention, get their money, get make that sale as quickly as possible. Security and privacy. So data security is very, very important. Do you have um, antivirus? Do you have malware software? And is it regularly updated? You know, the last thing you want is uh, because I mean, hackers are real. Cyber security is very, is very important. So the last thing you want is when you start uh, running transactions on your website, um, you don't want some smart hacker to come and, you know, hack into it and uh, do away with your hard end uh, sales. So you need to make sure that your antivirus is tight. Also have backups of all your data just in case, you know, keep on backing up so that even if there's an accident, you don't lose all your information. Then data privacy is also important. So I'm um, sure many of us head of the data privacy regulations uh, led by the EU, but even in Nigeria we, uh, and in Africa, we definitely have some of those. So find out, um, are you, are you in compliance with the requirements for data privacy? Are you allowed to, what, what can you do? When someone submits an email address on your website, what can you do with that email? Are you allowed to sell it to a third party? Are you allowed to contact them without permission? You know, knowing these kind of things will really just make sure you stay out of trouble and you don't uh, get sued later down the line. Then search engine optimization. So you need to be able to make, optimize your content for search, meaning, Make your um, so that when you type in, say your product is um, shoes. So if if your product is shoes, make sure the content is optimized. So that if someone types in shoes in Google, your website is one of the first ones that come in. There are experts that do a lot of these things. One trap you need to avoid as as a business owner: you can't you can't be all things that everyone you know you. As much as we try to be generalist, some of these things can be outsourced. So get an expert in SEO, search and engine optimization. And then make sure that you are regularly analyzing your traffic. There's a link here. You can Google it, Google SEO optimization guide. So by the time you do that, you should be able to get uh, a good um, understanding of how to, the preliminaries of SEO optimization. Now, what keywords are you using in your website? What are your competitors using? Some words are more, in, more, more searched for than others. An expert will just help you know what are those uh, words that you need to use in your website. So I'm, I'm going to show you, to illustrate this, so that you know it's not just a lot of theory. Um, there's a, this is, the I think it was yesterday, a couple of days when I was creating this presentation, I just typed in Jumia South Africa, and this was all popped up. What can you see? A white woman, you know, not surprising. Uh, uh, South Africa is, uh, at least the elite are predominantly white because they, are, they were colonized much longer than we were in Nigeria. So the white uh, presence is still very, very strong, very pervasive. So they use, guess what they use? She's a blonde. They're using a blonde woman to market their women's dresses. If you go to Jumia, South Africa, Jumia, Jumia Nigeria, you see here, a woman with kinky, a, a, a light-skinned woman, but she has kinky hair, so she's obviously black. You know, it's the same company, but you can see even the images they use on their website are different because of they know that they're targeting different audiences. So if you were if you were if you were marketing in South Africa, is a tip <laughs> as much as possible, get white models to, to market your product. You know, and if you come to Nigeria and you start putting pictures of blonde women, you know, you won't connect with your audience. So that's just a practical example. Then this uh, color um, wheel, it it um, helps you identify. It's actually interesting. Sorry, I know it looks complicated, but let me just explain what it is. So the letters A to J identify different cultures. Africa is I. So since we're talking about expansion, expanding to Africa, you can look at I. I is here. If you can see my cursor, I'm pointing at it. And then it on you can see from number one to sixty-four different um, values, buyer values, customer values. And then if you now um, you can you can match the number to the color to determine. So for example, okay, um, for example, uh, I. Uh, one of the one of the numbers that jump out at I, sorry, can you see? Can you see what I'm, I'm yeah. okay? So I, if you look at this I, you can see it's blank. There are no colors until you get to 
this number 48. You can see at the end of this is 48. So when you go to 48, what do you see? Religion, aha, Africa. Religion is a very strong value for us. So if you're going to understand the mindset of typical Nigerian, religion is, is actually very, very important. Um, as we go down, you know, you see the next green is 52. 52 is life. Ah, obviously, we love life a lot in this in this part of the world. Um, not that other country, uh, other uh, countries are not as religious or you know don't have these values. But for example, okay, let me look at learning. For example, 51, 51. Africa is not strong in learning. Not like we don't like learning, but on the average, the average African is more, will be more passionate about matters of faith and spirituality than matters of maybe academic things or, or learning. So this just gives you an insight into the mind and the values of the culture that you're looking at. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting if you want to, uh, after looking at uh, Africa, if you want to expand to other countries, what are the values? So you, you don't even have to travel to understand what people value in some of those places. Using this wheel, you have a good insight into the mindset of, of, of other countries and other cultures. Right. Okay. So. Um, Sorry, just a minute. <laughs> it's over. Tech, uh, tech hitch. Okay. Okay. Next, social media review. So uh, this probably goes without saying, but um, obviously, social media is very, very important as a marketing tool. You need to be on the right sites, not only for your country but other sites in other countries. Now, the limitation of social media, obviously, is that unless you advertise, you can only reach your own audience. So um, I'm sure many of you invest in Facebook ads and Instagram ads and, and all that. So um, it's very important for you to, to boost and sponsor your post so that you can increase your audience. We're going to pick up each of the channels one by one and we'll just talk about the peculiarities of each channel so you decide whether it's going to be part of your international brand strategy. So Twitter, tweet, <laughs> even though Twitter has been banned <laughs> recently, but Twitter is uh, a bit of, it, it's, it's a, a good place for conversation, for dialogue, for conversation, for uh, intellectual engagement. So it's a, it's a good megaphone that helps you get out the messages and content that you put on, on your website. It allows you to have conversations with your customers and receive feedback. The only downside is that you know, it requires consistency. Twitter is not somewhere that you go and post every two weeks and then you think you get traction. You have to be there and follow up. Also, it can get um, it, trolling. Trolling or negative feedback can be very uh, prevalent in Twitter. So if you're going to engage with people, you know, especially as a, as a company, you need to watch your tone and be professional so that you don't offend people unless, um, um, unconsciously. Now, secondly, Facebook. Facebook has been the leader in B2C applications, so business to customer. So meaning if you sell directly to customers, maybe you're into fashion, you're into food, uh -huh, then that's you sell to individuals, you sell hair. Facebook is actually good. Advertising is not so expensive and you can focus. So for example, if you want to expand to Ghana, you can actually make sure your ads show only in Ghana as opposed to Twitter. When you post on Twitter, it goes everywhere and you, know, you, can't, you, can't, you can't control it. But with Facebook, you can set it for the country that you want it to show up in, if it's Kenya, if it's Senegal. Uh, of course, they've had some challenges around data privacy. So, you know, everybody has been worried, oh, what, am I, what are they doing my Facebook data? You know, uh, they're, they're monitoring me, you know, why are they invading my privacy and all that. Uh, but still, it's also less used by millennials. So uh, maybe they think it's not cool anymore. So you see men, the older people, so my, like my dad has a Facebook account and he, he posts there, but my sister doesn't have a Facebook. She thinks, you know, Facebook is passe, like there's no need, no, but no, no young person goes there anymore. So again, who is your customer persona? If you're selling to older people, Facebook might be good, but if you're selling to like the uh, younger generation, then maybe you try something else. Just again, check to confirm its importance in your country. You know, is Facebook big in Ghana? Is it big in Senegal? Is it big in Kenya? So that you know whether it's going to be an important part of your strategy. LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is the top professional site for, um, for business B2B communication. So by B2B, I mean, if you're a service provider, maybe you um, provide consulting services, you provide legal services, you're, you're an estate manager. In other words, you sell to companies. 
So if you want to connect with executives, LinkedIn is the place to be. You make sure you have, you should make sure you have a company page and then make sure it's up to date. Don't just have your personal profile as the CEO, make sure your company has a page on LinkedIn and keep on updating it as news comes up. Also, almost all employers check out prospective employees on LinkedIn. And then you need to make sure that uh, the, the, the profile you have on LinkedIn is, is uh, interesting because people will always check your background there. Instagram. Now in Nigeria, Instagram is probably uh, the number one social media channel. Uh, it allows you to use images, whether it's photos and GIFs to tell your story. Um, it's very popular in Nigeria, but you need to check that Instagram is, in, is as popular in that African country you want to go to as it is in Nigeria. Don't just assume that you know all, all, all Africans uh, love Instagram. You just might be surprised. It's good for visual marketing. So if you sell you know, bags, shoes, hair, clothes, it's, uh, it's, going to, it's a good way to, it's a good outlet and it's keep getting even more popular like Facebook, which is on the decline. Then YouTube, YouTube is, uh, is also another very important channel. You should consider having your own YouTube channel. If you sell something that requires tutorials, uh, if you need to show people step-by-step -step, uh, processes, uh, troubleshooting or they need to learn how to assemble things great because it allows you can shoot upload a video of yourself taking people through the steps uh, in a way that Instagram is just you know they just need to get a picture and out so you can't teach anything on Instagram so when you link your YouTube channel to your website it significantly increases your your Google ranking so that's also something that is great then if you now want to use more than one channel so you want you know how you want your content to show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn at once. You can use an aggregator, something called Hootsuite. So you post uh, the same message across various social media sites on different accounts. It helps you save time and increases the impact of your messages. So now we're now looking into legal. So as you, okay, so we've taken a uh, part, taking care of the first part, which is marketing, making sure that uh, people see you a certain way, making sure you're perceived in a certain way. So now that, you know, uh, you've attracted attention in the markets you want to go to. How do you now go into actually delivering value? And of course, you know, uh, the law is very, very important. So, quick fact the business world is very litigious. People like to sue each other. Maybe not so much in Nigeria, but you'd be surprised outside this country, you know, uh, it doesn't take much before they slam a lawsuit on you. And so the only way to avoid this is to make sure you have very solid contracts. You need to, as you start thinking of your international expansion, you need to have a qualified lawyer review very well every critical document, internal and external. Different attorneys uh, specialize in different things. So make sure that the, whichever attorney or lawyer you choose has experience in cross-border contracts. Don't go and pick somebody that's only ever practiced in Nigeria and advise you on contracts in Gambia. As much as possible, try and get a red and in, in, in someone that has experience in that country that you want to move to. Also, be sure to research the legal handling of disputes. Uh, you know, you 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 need to make sure that um, uh, the because people tend to make sure people tend to rely on or people tend to trust the people want to trust the people that they do business with. So, as you're thinking about how to enforce contracts, make sure your personal character is also sound. Then jurisdiction, where would the contract be based? In what country, state, or region? Um, it, it may be, if you want to expand to maybe Senegal, and you put in your contract that if there's any um, dispute, it's going to be handled uh, in, the federal in, in the Federal Republic of Senegal, for example, then you, know, you need to be very sure that you have what it takes to win a legal battle in Senegal. If you're not, then make sure you wait with your expansion plan. You know, this is why I've said it's not just about branding and, you know, making all the noise, but, you know, if you sell something and, uh, you, and people want to sue you, maybe because they feel they didn't get the value, you'll be able to fight that battle. You don't want uh, one law, you know, one loss, one lawsuit can shut down a company. So you don't want that to happen to you. So make sure uh, before you including your contracts, that there's going to, the contract will be based in that country. Make sure you have what it takes to uh, do the legal battles. Uh, will you need attorneys? Will you need, need mediators? Will you need arbitrators? Get advice. Then intellectual property. Uh, you need to know the international conventions that uh, extend your ownership in, in foreign markets. By international property, uh, in intellectual property, I mean something like a trademark or a brand, you know, uh, 
you can tell me what's the most important asset that Coca Cola has. Obviously, it's it's IP, it's its intellectual property. The the formula for distilling Coke is under lock and key, under heavy security. Because the day it gets out, people are just going to duplicate that product and they will lose their competitive advantage. So they keep it under lock and key. So you may not be uh, obviously you're not producing Coke, but you have must have some things you produce that you have what they call trade secrets. So how are you going to protect those trade secrets? You know, you don't want to, again, introduce a new market, a new uh, product in a new market, and then um, people uh, duplicate it, and then you can't protect yourself. So if that's going to happen, it's better you just stay in Nigeria instead of, instead of uh, having that happen to you. So you're in, also in terms of your uh, corporate entity, how is it structured? Is it suitable for that market? Your tax, do you understand the tax? tax liabilities where you're going to do you understand fully the kinds of different taxes you're going to have to pay if you want to raise capital do you know what it takes to raise capital in those countries um human resources very 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 important your business is just as strong as the people you have on your team so new markets have new rules of law for hiring and firing employees and independent contractors in nigeria for example minimum wages i think is thirty thousand. so if you hire someone and pay them thirty thousand, you don't have to pay uh, you don't have to take on the employee burden of maybe pension, uh, tax, uh, health insurance, and all that. But once you start paying salaries above 30000 by law, you have to start filing all those things. So you need to understand what are the rules for hiring people, what are the rules for firing people. Uh, you also need to pay attention to rules on employee benefits, which I discussed. So healthcare, is it compulsory to provide health insurance for your employees? Is it uh, compulsory to give them vacation? You'd be surprised, you know, if, if it's compulsory and you don't do that, you could get into trouble. Uh, do you need to give them paid time off? Is profit sharing um, uh, a requirement? What's, term what's the termination package like? Are you allowed to, to fire people and under what circumstances and so on? So you need to keep abreast of all these. Then your sales contracts, are they appropriate for cross-border uh, trade. I've already discussed dispute handling. So, under which law or jurisdiction? If you if you if you're not familiar with the rule with the laws in the country you want to expand to, then just your contract. Just say this contract is enforceable in Federal Republic of Nigeria and play it safe. Only put uh, that uh, the foreign juris jurisdiction when you are sure that you're competent to face what comes out of it. Then also you need to think about uh, your contracts with your agents, distributors resellers or licensees again review the contracts uh in some country some com, some uh countries when you hire an agent the person is almost like an employee he has the same rights as an employee so you know you, you, know, you can't just uh maybe uh restrict for example restrict is uh one common way of dealing with agents is to say um i'll give you a percentage of uh the commission on your sales that's that's you know rule of thumb but you'd be surprised if the agent has employee rights, whether he sells that month or he does not sell that month, you must pay him. So know, knowing all these things ahead helps you design your sales, sales management practices appropriately. Also, if you uh, franchise your, your business, some of those licensees uh, will also have additional rights. Also, what are the tax implications? That's also very important. I've spoken about intellectual uh, property, uh, just to mention again, there are also time limits, you know, there's some things you can protect for five years and maybe you invent, you, there's some things you can uh, protect for five years. After those five years, uh, you can't extend it. And then, so you just need to be aware of, of the of the time limit. Um, in developed countries like US and Europe, it's easy to protect intellectual property rights. In Nigeria, <laughs> it can be very problematic because as you can imagine. So you need to have a strategy. If you're not going to use the law to protect your IP rights, what, what else are you going to do? Then entity form formation. Just to give an example, in, in, in Nigeria, we have uh, different types of companies, uh, companies, limited, limited liability companies, business names, uh, partnerships. In the US, you have persons, partnerships, LLCs, S Corp, C Corp, Different countries have different uh, um, forms of legal entities. So the, where you're going to, you need to really understand what are different types of legal entities they have there so that you know the best way to incorporate your company. Um, it, it's, it's important for tax so that you know uh, who, who is going to tax you and whether, where, where, who will you owe part of your income. It's also important for liability reasons and it's important if you want to add investors so you know what are their requirements. 
human resources, we already discussed this. What are the labor laws in the country you want to go to around wages, vacation, severance? Potential issues could be harassment. You know, um, I know, you know, obviously in developed countries, they take issues of sexual harassment very importantly. In, your, in the country you're going to, you also need to know how serious is it so that you start training your staff early. You know, some companies have trainings for their staff on, um, you know, what, what is appropriate and what is inappropriate in the context of the workplace, just to make sure you don't get into trouble. Also, this helps you realize that uh, as you think of creating a global company, you need to create a team that can function well in cross-cultural settings. You know, is there someone on your team that speaks Swahili, that speaks um, Africans? You know, those kind of people will be very, if you don't have them, then this is time to start thinking about getting people like that so that when they get into um, those foreign countries, they can adapt and uh, engage and, and relate very well. Okay, so that's about legal. Now we look at your accounting. Now, um, intellectual, inter, international business is, uh, is, it can be very complicated. So some um, companies can partner with, you can come partner with, you know, depending on the size of your company, you can partner with the big consulting firms to give you tax and accounting advice. But um, regardless of, you know, whether you get a consultant or not, you need to know a few things. First of all, your system, I don't know, if you use a manual system, this is the time to upgrade to uh, maybe Sage, Wave, uh, Wave, or, you know, another accounting system. You can't, you can't be, you know, this paper and pen thing is not going to work if you want to start looking at selling abroad. Why is that? Because when you start having multiple projects in multiple countries, and there are multiple currencies, multiple exchange rates, multiple tax codes, obviously, Paper and pen is not going to do the work anymore. So you need to get a, get a proper accounting system. You need to use a decide. Are you going to use a cash basis for preparing your accounting? Your accounts. Are you going to use an accrual basis? Um, obviously, this is not an accounting class. So we're not going to go into too, too much detail. And again, many of you uh, probably have accountants that can that can walk you through. But you need to. Some of the questions you need to ask are: Can your existing existing systems? accommodate cross-border transactions, are they flexible enough? Your accountant, the one you have now that does your books in Nigeria, ask him, does he understand the practicalities of cross-border business? Does he have the resources to manage it? So um, if you have to file, pay taxes in uh, Namibia, does he have, does he have uh, people in the Nam Namibian Inland Revenue Service that can help him remit your taxes? If he doesn't, this is the time to start looking for somebody else. Does he have, oh, even if he doesn't have presence there, I mean, come on, how many, let's face it, how many Nigerian accountants have multinational presence? But at least they, he should have partners, he should have somebody there that he can ask questions when issues arise. Also, your system. Does your current system allow for you to get current information on payables and receivables? Why is this important? Because remember at the beginning I said uh, doing business internationally is like playing chess in 3D. Here in Nigeria, maybe you have at the back of your mind, okay salaries are due every 30 days uh my my clients pay me every 60 days so you can plan your cash flow to make sure you don't run out of cash once you start having uh international transactions then your payables and receivables you cannot imagine the complexity you know some people will now find maybe uh when they have a branch in ghana uh if their receivables don't come in on time they have to start sending some cash from the Nigerian office to settle salaries in Ghana, you can just imagine the complexity now uh, goes up the roof. Also, allocating costs between projects and countries. When you start uh, trading, transfer it's called transfer pricing. When you start transferring money from one entity, from, an, from your company in one country to your company in another country, then how do you even um, start calculating your profitability? especially taking into consideration uh, interest, uh, exchange rates and things like that. Uh, also, you need to think about your taxes, value added tax, sales tax over there. Then, or, like I said, use the opportunity to update your accounting practices and procedures. It goes without saying, even if you take nothing else from this webinar, if you want to go cross border, please get an accountant, get an accounting system, leave this paper and pen thing, try and understand your accounting system so that um, it can be, it can be fit for purpose. Uh, some of the cro popular cross-border issues are value-added tax, corporate tax, transfer pricing, foreign exchange fluctuations. You need, you need to know the impact of, you know, the exchange rate of maybe Naira and CD. 
or you know rand or what any other country you're going to so that um when you're even setting your payment terms you can work appropriately okay someone's hand is raised but i think we'll take questions after we're almost done <laughs> mr kabir so it's noted uh once we're done we'll take questions then also make sure your accountant can provide you with advice on the above you need to find an, a higher accounting services from an accountant or a firm with extensive experience in these kinds of cross-border issues. I cannot mm -hmm. overemphasize it enough. Don't just rely on you. That's one thing. Um, in fact, there was a survey by P uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers on SMEs, and they asked them, where do you get your advice? 22% 20, said that they get their advice from the internet, from media. 15% uh, said they get their advice from family and friends. I think it's like 10%. And I'll say, saying, okay, we ask our accountants, we ask our lawyer. You can get away with it in Nigeria because you know how we are here. You know, we can be very flexible in lots of things. But if you're thinking of going abroad, don't go online and think you can Google your way into knowing the tax regulations there. Get an, a professional, you know, don't rely on yourself. Don't start asking your friends and family. Get, get a proper professional, be well represented, you know, and... Uh, you, I mean, you're smart, obviously, you're, you're, for, for you to have been doing business for so long, obviously, you're on top of your game, but um, you can't know everything. Nobody can know everything. So make sure you get proper qualified professionals to advise you. So just as we are rounding up the session, uh, don't forget, review your current accounting system. Can it accommodate cross-border transactions? And your current accountant, does he understand the additional requirements of cross-border transactions? Now, last but not least, we look at your process review, your processes. Are your systems ready to serve a global customer base? Your customer relationship, um, your customer relationship management system, is this set up to work real time across time zones? That's very important. If currently your um, the CRM you have in Nigeria is set up to respond to customers uh, from eight to five, if you're going to another country, the time zone will be different, right? So you can't use the CRM system you use in Nigeria for your cross-border transaction. You need to take those time zones into account. Also, your suppliers, can they expand as you do? Um, uh, people that uh, supply you with the raw materials you need for your business, can they also supply uh, in those countries you want to go to? If they can't, who can help you with that? Uh, for example, it's... it's um, it's been a case happened of a, a company founder that had a tech company that had a small digital component that uh, was very crucial for their operation. So they never considered that they needed to get, they never considered the international uh, standards for that component. And so when they um, launched their cross-border operations, they could not get suppliers to supply um, that particular uh, component. So it cost them a lot of time and money. So you need to make sure that uh, the way your company is structured, your operations, your workflow will be able to scale with you. So if many of you may be, you know, just thinking about this for the first time, so I will recommend uh, Michael Gerber's book, such as The E-Myth for a Good Look at Processes. It's called E-Myth Revisited. It's very popular. It's a bestseller. More than one million copies sold. Why most small businesses don't work and what to do about it. So start looking at your systems. Also, The Goal by Eli Goldratt. That's a very good book on constraints and operations that you should take a look at. So again, I think we've mentioned this, but it bears speaking again. What are the strengths and weaknesses of your employees in terms of growing an international business? I know someone that started, set up a farm uh, outside in, in the Southwest and he trusted his manager implicitly, you know, only to find out that, you know, he was stealing him blind. It's a common practice, but, you know, he almost lost his investment. Now this is, it, it, he was cheated between in Lagos and maybe Ibadan. Now you now want to go several thousand square miles uh, to another country. So how trustworthy are the employees you have there? What are the safeguards you have to check, check and make sure you won't be swindled? You can't go there every day. You can't go there every month. You can't go there every week. So how are you going to supervise and monitor performance and make sure people aren't uh, robbing you of your due? Then I think I've mentioned CRM systems. Are you getting the data you need on a timely basis? Um, some of you may or may not have very sophisticated CRM systems. So for example, do you know how if you do you know how many leads you generate on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis? Do you track it? Do you know how long it takes to convert a lead from a prospect to a customer? 
you know, you need to know this information so that you can, you know, whether it's the same uh, outside and if it's not, how to, how to, um, how to structure your strategy to take that into consideration. Um, then suppliers, okay, I've spoken about that. Can scale with your international growth. Uh, then also for different uh, companies that different international standards. So ISO, International Standard Organization, you know, they have so many standards. So check that it's uh, your company is uh, compliant with the ones for the target country you want to move to. Even electrical voltage differences. If you are into manufacturing and you have a factory in Nigeria, and you've structured everything and you know you know how much electricity you need to generate to uh, manufacture product. guess what if you go to ghana the electricity situation is very different you know so you also have to know what are the voltage is that is the the voltage is it higher lower lower better than nigeria so all these things you know you absolutely they sound trivial but you'll be so surprised if you take the assumptions that have worked in nigeria to another country there's uh, it, it, it could actually result in uh, in a lot of difficulty for you. And okay, I was talking about time zones in terms of the service centers, uh, your suppliers. Uh, how are you going to deal with that? Do you have necessary language skills? Do you have multilingual? Can your employees speak French? That one is basic. Many francophone countries in Nigeria um, have they been trained in cross cultural understanding and negotiations and uh, so on. Um, right. Okay. So. Uh, this, I, 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 I hope you've enjoyed the session as, as much as I have. Uh, this is just an introduction, a very, very high level introduction to this subject. Uh, there are so many other intricacies that you can, you can, uh, that you can, you, you, you can get information on. So if you need more information, you know, just send me an email at uh, glory.ininaya at kiosafrica.com. I can recommend courses, can recommend the uh, trainings that you can take that will help you. Uh, with your cross-border strategy. So again, uh, a word of uh, thanks to our, our sponsors, Keystone. Keystone is uh, one of the most SME-friendly uh, banks in Nigeria. They have a lot of, a lot of uh, offerings to support SMEs like you. So the loan offerings um, to support different industries, creative industry, finance, healthcare, um, school businesses. If you're a female entrepreneur, you can get loans at a discount if you want to uh, buy a long-term asset, you can get asset financing. If you want to become a distributor, you can also get key distributorship finance. Um, when you want to register your company, they can also help. And then, uh, you know, they provide a lot of capacity building, such as obviously this webinar that you're taking uh, part in, as well as the Pink Network and uh, and so many other things. So um, get in touch. If you, you, uh, get in touch with uh, any of these email addresses you can see on the screen, either the MSME unit, Pink Network, Helen Nguyele, who is the head of the SME unit, um, Clement Ezewele, and uh, Stella Onyawa. So thank you all so much for listening, uh, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, someone asked for my email address again. Okay, let me just... Um, project take that again okay so it's glory g l o r y dot e n y i double n a y a at clearsafrica.com <laughs> on a lighter notes <laughs> don't worry even if i want to do a cross border if i want to open a branch i will not consider changing my last name that, that's not one of the, the things I will consider, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but um, uh, language, just to point out that, you know, language, being, being comfortable with the language in your target country, uh, target market is also, is also very key. All right. So Clement, do you want to, do you have a question from me? Yeah, I have a couple of questions that okay. uh, participants have asked, and um, I must say that was a very insightful presentation. Thank you for how you were able to break it down, you know, so to speak. Thank you for the time you spent explaining many of those concepts that um, bother on branding per se. I see all the beautiful comments that we have from our participants saying how, you know, impactful the session has been for them and their businesses. We're happy.
to be part of your scalability as, as an SME. So um, recall that you can always shoot us an email if you have inquiries, you can shoot Glory an email as well. All right, feel free to bring your questions, bring it on. We're interested in your growth as a business. After all, at Keystone Bank, we grow together. That's not, we're not missing words when we say that. All right, so I'd like to start off with this question. I, I like the concept the, the persona concept. Okay. Know? So when I was following your presentation, you talked about the persona concept, and and then at some point, you also um, you know um, reference the the old saying that you know it's not good that you pour an old wine into a new wine skin. So I like to find out the cases where the in fact the attraction for 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 your product as as a business person is the uniqueness of your product in the local terrain so so that means that there's no need to tweak the product to suit the peculiarity of the new country right so how do you balance that because you were talking about how that you know it's important that you tweak the product to suit the peculiarity of the new country so how do you balance that how do you know that okay what's even the attraction what the biggest attraction is not even the uniqueness in nigeria so to speak like somebody in south africa wanting to patronize um, Nigeria because they appreciate Nigerian culture. All right. Do, do you want to say something about that? Thanks a lot. Sorry, uh, I'll crave your indulgence. A lot of my uh, uh, responses will be in the professional services industry, but uh, because that's the one I'm uh, most active in, but you can also take the lessons and apply them to. Yeah, sure, that's, that's okay. So um, I'll, I'll use my firm as an example. Uh, when I wanted to launch my international operations, um, the pitch was that uh, for my audience in Nigeria was that you can, if you log onto my platform, you can get consultants all over the world. So while that sounded good, there were immediate uh, practicalities around, okay, I want to do a business plan about uh, maybe palm, palm nut uh, uh, production in Yobe. Why do I need to go to somebody in Mexico to tell me about palm nut creation in Yobe? Is it not better to get a Nigerian consultant? So on at first, you know, it was like like you were saying, how do you match, how do you meet the needs of the local market with you when you're positioned as an international organization? Because some people are going to be skeptical, like, you know, let me just stick to what I'm familiar with. But what I did, you know, was to find uh, a unique value proposition uh, and make sure that there was a product market fit. So what in concrete terms, what I now started doing was for, for people that are interested in uh, launching technology businesses, I now started matching them with my international consultants. So someone wanted to start a cryptocurrency business. So I got him someone in Mexico. Obviously, in the developed world, they're more advanced than we are. So when you start talking maybe Bitcoin, cryptocurrency tech, they, are, they know better. So that kind of person in Nigeria was only too happy to have a foreign expert advise him on technology. But if I had gotten a foreign expert to start advising him on fishing and palm nuts, we'd be like, you know, what is that? So I didn't, I didn't, I'm just saying, don't get discouraged by saying, ah, no, uh, you can't sell um, the same product in, or rather, don't get discouraged by saying, what is going to be the relevance of my, what's going to be the relevance of my, of my product to um, the foreign market, just, you know, as much as possible, try to try to uh, do some, a bit of test marketing, do your market research uh, on getting to the minds of your customers so you know what's important to them so that you can end up uh, matching the right products, right, right market. So I hope my example has been able to just give, again, there's how many people on the call? About 125 and so there are 125 businesses. So every business is going to be different. But if you can just take from this example that find your unique value proposition and then use that to match the right product to, to the right market. So I think fantastic. So find your USP and use that to match the name. Interesting. I think that's, that answer pretty much does justice to the question. So I'd like to ask again, you talked about um, new market new rules in the course of your presentation. I, I found that very interesting as well. The fact that you must be conversant with the rules of the new terrain that you're looking to play in. All right. However, I reckon that usually these rules are not an exhaustive list. All right. You know, so there's, there's a tendency for you to want to overlook one or two of those rules. So what are your recommendations in terms of 
how to do an in-depth investigation on the, on the rules in a new country, in a new terrain? How do you advise that an SME does those investigation of new rules so, so, so they don't leave out very vital rules that can get them in trouble? You know, you emphasize the fact that they should stay out of trouble, all right? So how do they, I mean, what's your best approach? What's your recommended approach in terms of, you know, learning about the, the rules in the new terrain that they're looking to play in, in the international space? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So to make sure you don't miss anything out, it's always go, good to go with an experience guide. So um, we at the at the um, one of the things I do in addition to running to East Africa is I'm a consultant for a, a a company called the International Business Accelerator in the US. So they have a lot of experience with with uh, the founder of the IBA was a former. Um, ambassador to, the, to Germany. So he has a lot of uh, experience with international trade. So he has created a roadmap, you know, high level roadmap with uh, like a checklist, like to your point, you know, how, what are the, what are the five, six major things you need to look out for under each core uh, functional domain. So from a marketing perspective, what are the th key things you need to look at from the legal perspective, from the process perspective, from the accounting perspective. So time may not allow me to uh, spill all of them out. I've actually touched on a lot in my presentation, but, and, you know, that took an hour. But if, you know, anyone is interested in actually getting the actual roadmap, then you can just shoot me an email and reference this question, and I will be happy to send you. It's one or two pager, you know, just quick questions. Uh, that are very fundamental that you need to you need to take into consideration. So if you shoot me an email, I can share that roadmap. Thank you very much. So basically, a checklist will save the day. Yes. You know, roadmap yeah. presents to your roadmap, you know, as to what to expect and all of that. So I, I like to ask again. You mentioned in the course of your presentation um, the need to manage the possibility of swindling. You know, especially because sorry, the co need co possibility of suing. Okay, yes, or swindling, not even suing, swindling swindling. by your employees. Yes, yeah. by your employee. Okay. So, do you have any tools that you want to recommend that can prevent, you know, income leakage from swindling? That can, you know, help you manage possible swindling and all. Do you have any tools, e tools? Okay, well, inventory, and, inventory management tools are obviously very, very important. Uh, uh, you know, there's a Nigerian firm that recently launched one. I have a friend that has been trying to create one, but I'm aware there's a Nigerian firm that has launched one. I, I, it skips my mind, but if you just type in inventory management app in Nigeria, so if you can track your inventory, you know, then easily you can see the, if you can track it by period, you'll see the, uh, the trends. And so when there's an unusual depletion, you can, you can find see. out. Uh -uh. This is not December. December, for example, is a, a peak period. This is August. So why is our inventory so low? And then so that we, we've been selling and then we've been selling so much. So once you once you're able to, I, that's why I keep on a kind of as in data is is key when you're running a, a business you, mm. to know your numbers as a CEO at the tip of your fingers. So it's when you know your numbers that you can find out the discrepancies and immediately spot uh, where they are leaking. So I would, I would recommend, you know, keep on top of your numbers and uh, yeah. Fantastic. As so they say, uh, we, um, in God we trust, everyone else should bring data, so. <laughs> interesting so know your numbers basically and yeah. how to know your numbers is get an inventory management system uh, yeah because you don't go wrong with yeah. keeping track of your inventory and Absolutely. so this person is saying um when you don't have an accountant for instance how then do you manage business um in a new terrain if you're a first-time trader at least for the interim so I, I think what the person wants to know is are there ways you recommend that you if you don't have uh, an accountant for the interim you're still looking to hire an accountant I, I i know i reckon that you 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 had recommended in in your presentation that it's extremely crucial to get an accountant for your business but you know for that interim period would you just advise that they stay out of international trade related transactions or they can still there's a way they can maneuver so tell us okay let me let me let me say something uh because my first presentation for Keystone last year was on bookkeeping and, and SMEs. And I, one point that comes to mind is doing business without keeping accounts, it's like playing football without keeping school. So it's like <laughs> recreational, right? Like, you know, that's just, it's like a hobby. But because, I mean, why would you play ball as a, as a serious competitor? I and mean, some people play as, a, you know, amateurs or not everybody has to be a professional football player. But if you're going to be a professional football and you're playing to win, 
please, how can you win if you don't have a goalpost, if you're not keeping the score? You know, so you, you, in the same way, you know, you really, uh, because if you do business at the end of the day, you, you want to know if you're profitable. If you're not keeping accounts, how do you know if you're profitable? You know, so I mean, I, again, I don't want to sound too, um, because I studied accounting, I'm overselling the profession, but the reality is, uh, like I said, you you just need, you know, just you need to be able to to track your records you can go there for test marketing for pilot studies but even those will have to translate to numbers so for example you want to just uh, maybe to to for your, to to reference your question you've not set up an office you've not registered a company but you want to see if there's demand so you send out a shipment and then you ask a friend to act as a distributor you send out that shipment you record the cost of the uh, that maybe you had to pay for to uh, for the, to ship to that company. You record the amount in the consignment. You record the sales. You record maybe even the time, the money you had to pay to your distributor. And then when it's time to evaluate, you say, okay, was this a profitable transaction? If it was profitable, I will proceed to expand. If it was not profitable, I will have to tweak my strategy. So you don't have an accountant, but you still need to keep on top of your or your of your finances. If not, you know your you're playing without a goal post. Yeah, so that's, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much, Gloria. So last but not least, this person says that they want to personally connect with you on social media. So I think they, they, they would like you to share your social media handle. Okay, uh, okay. so um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm a consultant, so I'm, a B2, I'm very much a B2B uh, person. So I'm on LinkedIn as Glory Naya. I posted that in the chat. Um, I'm on, uh, my company is on Instagram as uh, clears.africa, but we also have, maybe you can even just go to, okay, let me share a freebie. If you go to my site, www.gloryinninaya.com, you can sign up and you sign up, you'll get a free entrepreneur's roadmap. It's a PDF that, because again, I found that many people do business uh, without really having a very structured approach. So you will get that free roadmap and you will get my subsequent newsletter. So even, so uh, you get to know me better and uh, even if, you know, you can pick up, so you can pick up a lot more information in addition to what I've shared on the webinar. So yeah, I hope, I hope that's helpful. So we can connect on LinkedIn, uh, on my IG page and uh, on my website. Yes. Then Thank I you. Ask this. I'm sorry, someone asked for my email address. All right, okay. Let me just Okay, you sent it. All right. I think it's been sent already. Right. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you very much once again, Glory, for making our time to be here. Um, we're excited that we that you brought your expertise on board. We, I mean, listening to you present just you know further buttress the fact that we had such an interesting lineup of faculty. So thank you for making our time to be here to educate our SMEs to contribute to economic betterment in in Nigeria, so to speak. Because this is trust me, whether you like it or not, some sort of quota that you're contributing. So I was talking about the fact that at Keystone Bank, we're passionate passionate about seeing you grow as an SME and one of the ways that we want to see you grow is via capacity building. When COVID-19 came, we decided to transit from classroom to virtual and that's why we started off our MSME online academy that brings you this webinar and it's been such an in impactful you know um journey so far so we've realized that this is this is a huge need in the sme space and we're we're happy to be able to fulfill that need we're happy to be able to bridge the knowledge gap that has been existing in this space for the longest time i see that a lot of people are asking about you know, uh, access to the the material to so the sessions that they have missed those who couldn't join the sessions before now uh, it's been it's been a, an impactful three days of knowledge sharing of you know of impact so to speak all right so if you're if you if you belong to that category or you simply just want to do a refresher even though you attended all the whole stretch you can visit look out for the materials on our youtube channel we're going to be posting the entire webinar series on our youtube channel thank you very much once again for joining i i want to believe that i'm not leaving out anything and any questions but in any case if you have any questions if you have feedbacks if you need to contact us for um whatever reasons you can shoot us an email and then we'll be happy to to, we'll be happy to um, 
and respond to your inquiries. You. Yes, um, we also have another webinar coming up and you should look out for that. It's, um, it's, it's Boost with Facebook. So trust me, you don't want to miss that. It's basically going to empower you with digital marketing skill that you need to um, move your business to another level, to a higher level. All right, so watch out for that. We're going to be also having subject matter experts come and, you know, basically take you through the rudiments of digital marketing. You don't want to miss that for anything in the world. Thank you very much once again for joining in. I like the passion a lot of you have demonstrated by joining from day one and making it to even this day. It also shows that um, Nigeria, not just Nigeria, Africa has such a huge future in terms of you know, GDP growth, in terms of you know, MSME empowerment. Thank you very much. Uh, on this note, I'd like to call it a day. My name is Clement Azeroli. And I see you next time.